testing one, two, three. All right, it works.
All right, folks, just a couple more minutes and then we're going to get started here. If anybody has any questions, feel free to ask before uh, we start lecture. Okay, so fun fact about the here. Um, so yesterday, I did not realize this. Somebody actually educated me on this. There is actually a feature in Zoom where I can actually have it print out a report of everybody that showed up. Now, I got to say, it really helps when you guys have your Zoom name be your actual name. Uh, for example, uh, I'm seeing like we have a Corey, we have a Grace. That's cool because you guys are the only Corys and the only Graces in the class. But I believe we have two Alexes. And today, thankfully, they uh, have their last names on their Zoom names. So that's great. Um, but your professors in your other classes, if there's more than one of your guys' first name, make sure you have your Zoom name. Also include your last name. So that way when they take attendance, everything works out. Um, but anyways, most important thing is, I actually don't need you guys to put here in the chat anymore because I just found out I can get that report of attendance. Uh, so the good news is if you come to class and you forget to type here in the chat, don't worry about it. It's all good. I'm going to get you anyway. Um, I got everybody. Uh, we had 30 out of 35 come to class yesterday. So all good there. So, um, so yesterday's lecture may have felt a bit rushed. Uh, spoiler, that's because it was. We, I combined my idea of what I wanted to do on Monday, which is basically just syllabus day, and then my planned Tuesday lecture, which was, here's how graphing works, uh, here's an idea of how bases and exponents work. Uh, I smashed those two lectures together in one day, so obviously things felt rushed. Today, we're going to be a bit more relaxed. Uh, I've had a couple of people ask about a homework problem. We're going to talk about that going to mention some vocabulary and then we're going to do some more work with bases and exponents and I think we're going to get to roots today. Um, but to start off I want to talk about homework problem. So I'm going to go ahead and pull that up and really props to you guys that uh, were using WebAssign's built-in ask the teacher button uh, props to you guys, because uh, that worked out really, really well. Um, you guys all had basically the same question, and I saw, you know, five students have asked about this question, so let's talk about it, because uh, it's very poorly written. Um, like I mentioned yesterday, first day of class, I am a graduate student, which means I do not pick out the homework. I do not write the exams. I do not write the homework questions. So basically my job is to teach you guys so that way y'all can do all that. Um, but at the same time, I'll pick it out. So if there's a question that you're like, hey, Mr. Midler, this is trash, odds are I'm gonna agree with you. Um, so anywho, we've got this question here. This is question 14 on uh, homework one. And the question asks us to evaluate the following expression. And basically, they want you to put the output here. And then it's given this condition. Like if you plug in x value that's greater than something, equal to something, or less than something. So whether you know it or not, this is actually a critical point question, uh, is how you might see it. Now, if you took MA100, specifically if you took it with Dr. Barnsley, I know she talks a lot about critical points. And this is very much a critical point question. And the critical point in um, that we care about here uh, relates to, we have a fraction. I specifically want to look at the bottom of this fraction. Um, now, one rule is that just generically in math, 
is that you can't divide by zero. Dividing by zero is a no-go. Um, it's actually undefined is how uh, we have that. Uh, you know, anything divided by zero, it's undefined. Uh, it's just weird. It's wacky. Nobody likes dividing by zero. Um, when you get to higher level math, you still don't like it, but you, there, there's some tricks. But for us right now, we can't really divide by zero. So when we have something in the bottom of a fraction, really, we just want to avoid becoming zero. So if I take this x plus 7 here, we really don't want it to become zero. So if I say x plus 7, please don't be equal to zero. Okay, and we solve this. We want to solve this for x. Easy way to do it. Uh, you undo things. So what's the opposite of adding seven? Subtracting seven. So subtract seven from both sides. And we hope that x is not equal to negative seven. So that's going to be your critical point. So actually, fun fact, all of these numbers here are negative seven. So if you're greater than negative seven, if you're equal to negative seven, and you're equal to negative seven. Again, apologies for handwriting. If I zoom in, that might help me. Eh, give me three. Um, so we want to evaluate this expression if x is greater than negative 7. So, and we want to do it for all three of these conditions. Personally, what I'm thinking is, let's just go ahead and just try different numbers. And, and that's the best thing to do. Now, I told you guys earlier, if it's equal to negative seven, it's undefined. And, and that's what they tell us to do right here. If the answer is undefined, just go ahead and type that. Um, so that's what you're gonna do there. And I'm running out of room, but you guys can type smaller than I can write. Okay, now if we're greater than seven. So at this point, just pick a number and see what happens. Personally, I think I'm just going to plug in zero. Zero is a number that's greater than seven. So if I take the absolute value of zero plus seven and I divide that by zero plus seven, I just get zero plus seven is a positive seven. Absolute value stays positive. So just good old seven over seven. And that is one. It turns out if you plug in any positive number, you're just going to get one. So our answer is gonna be one. Now let's do the same thing with some number that's less than negative seven. Uh, if I'm picking a number you know, that far left on the number line, let's just go with negative 10. So the absolute value, let's do a different color here. So if I do the absolute value of negative 10 plus seven all over, because we're always plugging these numbers in for x here, just a heads up. Uh, negative 10 plus 7. And we end up getting the absolute value of negative 10 plus 7. That's going to be negative 3. Its absolute value will be a positive 3. Negative 10 plus 7 on the bottom here will be a negative 3. And that will be equal to negative 1. So it turns out you always get negative 1 if you plug in any x value uh, that's less than 7. And I just want to show you guys real quick. Um, that if you actually graph this thing, there's this website called desmos.com slash calculator. Uh, you could use this or you could even use a graphing calculator. Um, you know, you can look at the graph and you can actually see that, yeah, for any value greater than negative seven, we just get one. We just get this horizontal line here. If you plug in anything less than negative seven, we get this uh, line down here at negative one. But notice there's nothing really going on. And, I, I'm trying to get as close as I can. And actually, Desmos tells me, it looks like you're trying to get to negative seven. And they're saying, nope, no can do. That's going to be undefined there. All right, questions about that. Okay. Trying to make sure... I have like chat and everything. So if you guys ask a question and, and whenever I say, does anybody have a question about that? Feel free, unmute, start yelling at me. Um, you, you have full permission to do that. 
Um, more chat. I'm just going to throw that over there. Okay. Okay, doesn't sound like we have too many questions going on, so I'm just gonna keep rolling along. If you guys want me to come back to that question or if you have more homework questions later on, perfectly fine, uh, that's awesome. Just let me know. All right, let's go with blue, regular, all right. So today is August 19th. And we are going to start off with, I want to quickly go over those exponent rules again, and then we're going to throw on a little bit more. Um, so bases and exponents. Now, yesterday in class, we talked about some rules. And the first one of those rules that I want to discuss was uh, rule number one, that was the addition. And the gist of that one was basically, if I had two like bases, if they were the same base, let's just use B for base, and um, I multiplied them and they had different exponents. Let's give this one a X, let's give this one N, um, what ends up happening is you basically just get that same base and then the exponent, you add the two exponents. Um, and a great example of this, I was doing powers of five yesterday. Let's do it with 10. Um, 10 is actually a really great one to use for this. So if I have 10 squared, 10 to the second power, times 10 cubed, 10 to the third power, we're going to get 10 to the fifth. Um, you can double check that yourself really good way to know if you're doing your exponents right, do it with tens because you just count the zeros. Later on this semester, when we're talking about logarithms and things like that, which are the opposite of exponents, uh, I'm going to be doing a lot of stuff with tens because I find those really easy to work with because we end up just counting the zeros. Um, 10,000, you know, I don't have to think too hard about what power of 10 that is. I just see one, two, three, four zeros. Oh, that's 10 to the fourth power. So nice little trick there. Um, I find it really useful. Uh, I think you will too later on in the semester when we do uh, some different things and we start trying to do the opposite of an exponent. Now, rule number two uh, that we talked about, we had the subtraction rule. And that was similar. That was similar to what we were doing with addition. The idea here was if I have some base, and again, it always has to be the same base. If you have like a two squared times five to the third, then you're just going to get four times 125. I mean, that's, you, you can't do anything with the exponents there. So nothing, nothing nice. So all of these rules are predicated on same base. So with the subtraction, um, same setup, let's just have some base to the x power divided by some base to the nth power. You're going to end up subtracting them. And we're going to get b to the x minus nth power. Um, that's going to be your exponent. And we can see that again with the tens. If you took 1,000 divided by 100, you get 10. If you have 10 to the third, divide by 10 to the second, you get 10 to the first. Um, the other thing you can think about, though, with that is recall yesterday I was talking about negative exponents. So, for example, b to the x times b to the negative n. That is the same thing as because you throw that b down to the bottom of the fraction, it's going to be b to the x divided by b to the n, which is just equal to what we were doing above. So that's the subtraction rule. And then we get the multiplication rule. And the multiplication rule is when you take an exponent to another exponent. And you'll see in a minute uh, how that can be incredibly useful, but also slightly dangerous. So 
the generic rule that you're going to see is something along the lines of if you have b to the x, if you have some base to the x power, and you take that whole term and you take it to the nth power, you get b to the x times n. Um, a lot of times they don't even put the multiplication dot there. They just see if they're letters, they'll just write b to the x n. That, that would be a way you could write that. Um, and what's interesting about this is your term, if everything's just strung together with multiplication, you distribute the exponent really nicely. Uh, an example of that could be, let's say we have b to the x, c to the y, all to the nth power. Okay, then we're just going to get b to the x times n, c to the y times n. And we just distribute that n onto the exponents for both of them. Now, this does not work if they're added together. So if I had the same thing with an addition sign in there, that is not going to be equal to the same thing. Oh, I don't know why my marker's misbehaving. Here we go. Oh, no. One moment, folks. I think it wants to erase now. Here we go. This does not work. Um, like I mentioned yesterday, when you do something along these lines, you end up uh, wanting to foil it. Uh, anytime there's an addition in there, you should be thinking, oh, I got to foil this. Uh, you can't just go straight to giving that exponent to both of them. That's going to be, uh, that's a no fly zone right there. Um, if you want to do something like this with numbers, um, a better example might be, let's go ahead and take five to the third power. So we have five cubed times two to the fourth power. And we take all of this to the second power. Well, in that case, what we would get is we would get five to the three times two, that would be the sixth power, times two to the four times two, that would be the eighth power. And that's gonna be uh, how we can distribute those exponents. So multiplication is really nice. You get a lot of things that come with it. Um, just a quick aside, this also works with zero. Right, so I could take 13 to the 80th power. Well, if I raise that to the zero, it doesn't matter. Anything to the zero is going to be one, always and forever. Anything to the zero power will always be one. The other thing to think about with this is when you have fractions. So if you have, uh, let's say two thirds, two thirds, and we raise that to the fourth power, what you end up doing is you give the fourth power to both parts of the fraction. You end up giving it to the top of the fraction and the bottom of the fraction. Uh, so we get two to the fourth over three to the fourth. And again, just a quick reminder, this is also the same thing as two to the fourth times three to the negative fourth. If it's living down below, you could also just write it as a negative exponent. Same thing, same thing. So those are the three rules. Now. Addition, subtraction, multiplication, feels like we're missing one, and we are. And that fourth one is division. Uh, dividing exponents works just the same way, more or less, as um, multiplying. Basically the same thing. So if I had, let's go ahead and take our generic setup we've been using. Let's take b to the x. And if I raise it to the 1 over nth power, that's just multiplication. Now, if you have a whole number times a fraction, that whole number is x over one in this case. So if you go ahead and multiply a fraction, top times top, bottom times bottom, what we're gonna go ahead and get is we're gonna get b to the x over n. Now, the interesting thing though, is a lot of times people don't wanna write it this way. Instead, the way they'll write it, and there's a couple options here. Um, this form here, I just want to point out, this is called 
the rational exponent form. You have that ratio of a fraction uh, as your exponent. So this is called rational exponent form. That matters because sometimes you get asked in a homework question to write your answer in rational exponent form versus, and here is the other option, you can write it in radical form. You can write it using a root, and that root is going to look like uh, b to the x all inside an nth root. So the way I read this in English is the nth root of b to the x. Another way you could write this, again, these are all equal, is this is the same thing as the nth root of b all to the x power. And again, that works because if you think back to how we initially multiplied this thing, I have b to the x all to the 1 over nth power. You could flip it. You could say this is equal to b to the 1 over nth power all raised to the x power. When you do that multiplication either way, it, it gives you the same answer. You're going to end up with b to the x over n. Uh, so either order that you do the multiplication in, it's going to work out. Um, the only new step re realistically is now anytime you have a fraction of an exponent, uh, you can write that as a root instead. Um, so I don't know about you guys, but personally, I like numbers a bit more. So uh, let's do some examples, maybe with some numbers here. Ah. Okay, you know, I think that might be my issue. There's a, there's a button on this pen I'm using, so that way I can write on the screen. I think every time I hit that, that's when uh, my thing starts misbehaving. So let's take the switch back to black. Square root of 25. All right, you might know this off the top of your head. I know your calculator does. Um, it's going to tell you this is 5. Now, anytime we write a square root, see, I just call that a square root off the top because anytime there is nothing written here in this part of the root, uh, it's implied that you're using a 2 there. So if there's nothing written by the root, it's an invisible 2. So square root, that is the second root of 25. Now, remember, 25 is actually just 5 squared. So another way we can rewrite this, this is just 5 to the 2 over 2. Anything divided by itself is going to be 1. That's the case here. 2, two divided by 2 is just 1. So we're going to get 5 to the 1, which is just 5. And we can keep manipulating this. Now, just like with the multiplication rule, if you have two things multiplied by each other and you raise it all to an exponent, you have to distribute it. We can do the exact same thing here. We're going to start with letters and then we'll introduce numbers. But let's say we have the cube root of x to the sixth and y to the uh, third power, y cubed. Um, you're going to go ahead, you're going to distribute it. We're going to get x to the 6 divided by 3 and y to the 3 divided by 3. And then 6 divided by 3 is 2, so we're going to get x squared, x to the second power. Then we're going to get y to the 3 divided by 3. So we're going to get y to the first power. Uh, so most people are just going to write that as just y, just good old y. Okay, gone through a couple of rules here. I've gone through a couple of examples here. Um, any questions about this? Someone said, can you please say what the names are again? Uh, the names of the different rules or the names? You can go ahead and unmute yourself. Uh, yeah, the names of the rules. Yeah, so the different rules. Right, so we've got the addition rule where if you have two like bases, you multiply them, you just add their exponents. We have the subtraction rule, where if you divide two things, same base, you subtract their exponents. We've got the multiplication rule, where if you have a base to an exponent and you raise it to another exponent, you just go ahead and you multiply them. And now we've just done the division rule. These are both in radical form. Uh, I don't know if you guys saw this on EDUCAT, but um, I do put the recordings 
of this up on YouTube so that way they fit nicely into EDUCAT. So if you go on EDUCAT right now, you can actually watch yesterday's lecture. Uh, also, these notes that I take in Paint, um, I save the image and I throw that up on EDUCAT as well. So yesterday's notes, um, what I did here on the screen, that is also up on EDUCAT. So you guys can peruse uh, this at your leisure. Because I understand, you know, I got to go through some material here. I might go through it with, you know, a bit of pace. So if you want to take your time, look at it, by all means. But great question. Anybody else? Okay. So let's keep rolling it along. Um, if I was doing this with numbers, um, here's actually here's actually a good example. Um, if you took, let's take, yeah, let's take the cube root of five thousand. Okay, now five thousand. There's a couple different ways to break this up. Five thousand is the same thing as so go ahead, draw our cube root again. This is the same thing as five times 10 to the third. Now, I can give this one third to both of them and I will. So this is the same thing as five to the one third times 10 to the, it already has a three, so three thirds. Well, three thirds is just one, so we're just gonna get a good old 10. Now here's the thing, there's no nice way to write uh, five to the one third power. Five does not have a nice cube root. So we're actually gonna leave that thing behind. I'm gonna talk more about this process later, but that's actually gonna stay behind in the root because there's no way for me to make that a nice whole number. Another way you could actually go about this, this 5,000 problem is you could actually rewrite this because um, 10 has a five in it and a two in it. So with 5,000, you actually end up getting five to the fourth and two to the third. Now let's go ahead and break this up. We're gonna go ahead and we're gonna get ourselves five cubes. There's another five in there. That's the addition rule, right? If I have five cubed times five to the one, that makes five to the fourth. So I'm gonna go ahead and break this up and then times two cubed. This is all still under that cube root. This is all still to that one third power. Well, five cubed, if I divide that by three, we're just gonna get a five. Two cubed, if I divide that exponent by three, we're gonna get a two. And then five to the one to the one third, I said earlier, that's no good. So that's gonna have to stay down there. And look at that, five times two, we still get our 10 back. So you'll find, especially on some of these homework problems that are involving numbers, they just give you a generic problem. This is actually a really good example of a homework question where they just give you a number and say, go ahead and simplify this. Go ahead and do as much as you can to break this down. A lot of times there's a couple different ways to do it. I saw right off the bat, I can go ahead, I can get that 10 cubed. What somebody else might say is, well, no, there's a whole bunch of fives in here and there's a whole bunch of twos in here. So there's a lot of different ways to attack some of these problems. There, sometimes there's only one right way to do it, but a lot of times there's at least another way to do it. Um, so if you have a homework problem and your friend has a homework problem and you go about it different ways, but you get the same answer, that's perfectly fine. Uh, and that might very well be how you were supposed to do it. Um, I'm gonna throw a complicated one out here just because I saw one like this on your homework. I just wanna prep you guys for it. So if you have good old X to the ninth, let's say Y to the 12th, all over, let's say N to the sixth plus M cubed. And this is all under a big fat cube root, third root. The top is nice, right? Because we're just gonna get nine divided by three. So we're gonna get X to the third. 
and we're going to get 12 divided by 3, so we're going to get y to the fourth. That's all nice. The problem is because there's this plus sign, just like with the multiplication rule, if you try and give an exponent to terms that are broken up by a plus or a minus, you can't really do it. You have to FOIL. Well, you can't really FOIL when you're going backwards, when you're actually making it smaller. So actually, the only thing we can really do is just leave it as cube root n to the sixth plus m cubed. Nothing we can do because of that plus sign. All right, any questions about that? All right, so let's keep going with roots. Okay, so let's do some more examples of those problems where they just tell you, simplify this thing. So if I have the square root of 125, now, 125 is actually the same thing as 5 cubed. So we can go ahead and write that way. Now, I told you guys earlier, if there's nothing written here, there's an invisible, I'm actually going to do a slight gray, there's an invisible 2 hiding out here. So realistically, what this problem is, it's basically just going to be 5 to the 3 halves. Now, there's a couple ways you can break this up. You can do like we did earlier. Uh, you could say this is 5 squared and 5 to the 1. And when you cut this in half, you're going to get a nice 5, and you're still left with a 5 left over. You could also go ahead and do this with a fraction. You could say this is the same thing as 5 to the 1, and then you have that other 1 half left. If you're wondering where I got the 1 from, that 1 is actually 5 to the 2 half. Right, so we're gonna try and break this up so we can get as many nice pieces out of it. And then what's left over is left over. Uh, so in this case, five to the two halves, that's just five. Five to the one half, still square root of five. Now, the other way to think about this, well, actually, before we get to that, we can do this with uh, variables as well. Uh, it doesn't just have to be with numbers. Uh, this works just as well with uh, variables. Uh, so if we have cube root, let's take n to the fifth, b to the sixth, a to the seventh. Few different ways to go about this. Let's go ahead and just do it the fraction way to start off. So this is going to be the same thing as n to the five thirds b to the six thirds, a to the seven thirds. That was a terrible seven, my goodness. It is harder to write on my laptop, so I'm doing the best I can. But still, my goodness. Oh, so let's go ahead. We're gonna try and break those fractions into as many nice components as possible. Try to get as many whole exponents uh, and then what's left over is left over. So five thirds, I know that's, I'm gonna get at least three thirds out of that. So I'm gonna get n to three thirds and then n to the two thirds. So two thirds plus three thirds, that makes our five thirds here. Go ahead and show that. Uh, so I'm just showing you guys that we're trying to break this up as much as we can. n to the three thirds, that's just n, so we get n and then we get a cube root of n squared. All right, with the b's, this is gonna be really nice. Uh, we're actually going to get b to the 3 thirds, b to the 3 thirds. Those are both nice. We're just gonna get a good old b squared. And then a, it's almost really nice because we're gonna get 3 thirds. We get another 3 thirds. And then we also get one left over. So this is going to be a squared, and then also we get a to the one-third. So I'm just going to write that as a cube root. Now, whenever you're multiplying together things that are in a root and things that are not in a root, so the stuff on the outside, you're going to slap that all together separately. So I have an n on the outside plus two, or not plus, times two b's, right? We have b squared times a squared. 
So we're going to get n, b squared, a squared. Outside stays outside. Inside stays inside. So we're going to get a cube root n squared a. And that is going to be our final answer. Now, the other way to think about this, and this is actually the way that I end up showing people, and I think they like it a lot, but I just want to show uh, y'all the fraction way in case you appreciate that more, is think about this as we're going to break out of prison. We're going to break out of jail. Okay, and the root is going to tell us basically like the, like, maximum security level that we have right a square root that's a pushover cube root all right now we're in like county and then you get like a fifth root okay now you're in like federal jail and like you need like al capone to help break you out so with let's go ahead and let's get some bigger numbers here let's go ahead and go for the fourth root and let's do n to the six w to the seven uh, let's do S to the eighth. Let's do L to the ninth. Okay, so you need four, You need a group of four to get one out. So I can go ahead and I can write, so we have six ends. So once, so I have a group of four and I got two here. All right, now here's the thing though. These three are gonna perish getting their one buddy out. So we're gonna get N, these two didn't make enough friends, so they're stuck. Four through N squared. With the seven W's, we're gonna have a group of four, and we're gonna have a group of three. Now the three didn't make enough friends, they can't get out. These three are gonna sacrifice themselves to get their buddy out. So we're gonna get W times the fourth root of, we have three W's multiplied inside, Still, so W cubed. And you can see where this is going. Now, S to the eight, honestly, I would just go ahead and spot, oh, that's just gonna be eight divided by four. That's nice, there's not gonna be any leftovers here. That's just good old S squared, sure. But then we have the L's and we have group four, group four, and one leftover. These six are going to sacrifice themselves for their friends. We're going to get two of the L's out, and one is still going to be left in. And just as I was saying earlier, that means we're going to have uh, stuff on the outside, multiply on the outside, stuff on the inside, multiply on the inside. Out times out, in times in. So I have an N. I have a W. I have S squared. I have L squared, and now what's left over on the inside? We have N squared, W cubed. That was a terrible W. I can do at least a little better than that. All right, no S's, and I have one L. So there's a couple different ways to think about if you're taking a giant root, everybody's multiplied together, what comes out, what stays in, couple different ways to look at it. Some people just want to do the fractions, just break apart fractions and la di da. Great. That's fine. If that works for you, that's great. I'm happy for you. A lot of times though, people are not so thrilled to be trying to break apart fractions. So they want to see, you know, I have whole things, what's happening to the whole things. This is a good visual. So any questions on the breakout method for taking fractional exponents? And for the record, this is not something that's taught in your book. So if you if you go digging through the ebook and you type in like breakout method, uh, spoiler, not in there. Not at least until I write a math book. All right. Okay, so let's talk about a couple other things. And then I'll mention a bit about the homework. And then I'm smelling the finish line for today. Okay. Um, one thing to consider with roots is um, we have things called conjugates. And conjugates are neat, and they're going to serve a really slick purpose for us. Uh, but first, we need to know what the heck a conjugate is. 
So let's say you have a term, let's say you have a fraction, right? Or not even fraction, let's say you have a term. Um, let's do numbers. Two plus four square roots of three. Sure. The conjugate of this thing, all you're gonna do is you're gonna change this sign right here. That's all you're gonna do. Flip that. So then the conjugate of this is going to become two minus four square roots of three. So this works best with square roots. Um, this doesn't really work nearly as nicely with cube roots and quartic roots and all those other ones. Um, quartic is for fourth roots. I should just say fourth root at that point. Um, but when you have some kind of a term where you have a square root involved and you want to get rid of that square root, odds are you're going to be thinking about, hey, how can I get a conjugate in here? So, and the reason a conjugate is nice is because if we multiply these two terms by multiply two plus four square roots of three times two minus four square roots of three, um, we're going to do the method we talked about yesterday. We're going to talk, we're going to use foiling. So if I do first two times two, we're going to get four outer. Uh, that's actually going to be a minus, minus eight square roots of three. Inner plus eight square roots of three. And then last. So we're going to get minus 16. So you multiply the outsides and you multiply the insides. Like I was talking about earlier, out times out, in times in. So we're gonna multiply the insides. So the square root of three times three, square root of nine. Now nine has a nice square root. It's gonna be three. So three times 16, this is all minus 48. So this whole term ends up becoming, notice here, we have minus eight square roots three and plus eight square roots three. So those are actually going to cancel. Uh, this I turn into the minus 48. So this whole thing is going to be 4 minus 48. So we're going to get a negative 44. So anytime you multiply a term that has a square root in it by its conjugate, you're always going to get a nice rootless number, nice whole number. Uh, in this case, it's not actually a whole number. It's an integer, but same difference. Uh, so the formal definition is any time you have a term of the form a plus b square roots of some number n, the conjugate is going to look like a minus b square roots of n. If you multiply them together, I guarantee you, you're going to get a nice, uh, beautiful, rootless number. Now, where is this useful? A lot of times, mathematicians hate having square roots in the bottom of a fraction. Uh, square roots in the bottom of a fraction is a no-go. A lot of people really dislike that. Um, there's a whole host of reasons why. You should come chat with me in my office hours if you want to know more about that. But uh, for right now, uh, I just want to show you guys something that looks like your homework problem and where they ask you to rationalize something. So if you're asked to rationalize something, they're not asking you to think about it logically. They're asking you to get rid of the radicals. You know, to rationalize in math means to get rid of radicals, to get rid of root symbols. Um, so in this case, we're going to do an example. And that example is going to look like 5 divided by the square root of 23 minus 5. So the first step is we want to rewrite that bottom of the fraction, that denominator of the fraction. We want to rewrite that in um, this nice formal uh, form, this uh, standard form of, rat of a radical. So we want to get the root in the back, and we want the regular number, we want the whole number in the front. So negative 5 plus square root of 23, all divided by 5. Okay, so we have this set up. Now, I said earlier, we want to multiply by the conjugate in order to get rid of the root sign. So 
but this is a fraction. We got to do this nicely. We got to do this fairly. We got to do this evenly. So the way we do this is, yes, you're going to multiply by the conjugate. So we're going to multiply by negative 5. And the only thing that's going to change is this sign right here, the sign between your integer and your radical. So minus square root of 23. All we changed was we changed that plus to a minus. Now here's the thing though, we're gonna multiply not only the bottom of the fraction by this, we're gonna multiply the top. Because anytime you multiply uh, by a fraction that's the same thing, top and bottom, that's multiplying by one. So you're not really changing it, you're just changing how it looks. And that's the idea behind rationalizing these fractions. You're not actually changing the value of them, you're changing how they look. So let's go ahead and change how this thing looks. We're gonna multiply top and bottom by negative five minus square root of 23. And when you multiply fractions, remember, we're gonna multiply the top times the top. So top times the top and bottom times the bottom. Uh, on the bottom, we're gonna have to foil. Up top, not so much, don't need to. So five times negative five, we're gonna get a negative 25. Five times negative square root of 23, we're just gonna get minus five square roots of 23. Out stays on the outside, inside stays on the inside. There is no square root attached to this five here, so I'm not gonna try and force it in. We don't need to. Now, on the bottom here, we're gonna need a FOIL again. Um, the good news is I already know we're gonna be canceling stuff out, so I'm not gonna be too stressed about it. Uh, so we're gonna get negative five times negative five uh, for our first, so it's gonna be 25. All right, outer, so negative five, times the negative square root of 23, so plus five square roots of 23. Inner, so we're gonna get negative five times square root of 23, so minus five square roots of 23. Look at that, we're already canceled. And then last, so square root of 23 uh, times minus square root of 23. So we're just gonna get minus 23. The square roots will cancel out when you do that multiplication. That's why this is really nice with square roots. It doesn't really work with cube roots. You need three of them to do that. Um, so to simplify this, so up top, nothing more we can do, right? Negative 25 minus five squared is 23. That's awful. That's disgusting, but that's what it is. And there's nothing we can do about it. On the bottom, we have 25 minus 23. That's just going to be two. And we have odd numbers, and we're trying to divide them by two. Nothing we can do. Nothing we can do there. So that's going to be it. Um, all right. So thanks for following along. We just rationalized our first um, denominator. Now, on the homework, I will say, even though it's not typical mathematics practice, there is actually a problem where they say rationalize the numerator. Um, it's just an exercise where they're like, hey, here's a fraction. There's a square root in part of it get it out of there and basically play in the other part. You'll notice we didn't have actually, um, we had a square root in the bottom here, but we didn't have it up here. And basically whenever you rationalize a fraction, you're basically moving the square root from one part of the fraction to the other. And that's what we end up with, ends up in the top. Um, so there's a homework problem um, on, I believe it's either assignment three or assignment four where they ask you, you know, go ahead and rationalize the numerator. Another problem, go ahead, rationalize the denominator. You're not familiar with that process. Um, they have a whole bunch of problems, whole bunch of problems, where they ask you to simplify different radicals and exponents. So you're going to be using a lot of these techniques, the breakout technique. You might want to use the splitting of fraction and definitely a whole bunch of using just the generic rules. So that's your division rule, your multiplication, your addition, your subtraction. Um, tomorrow, we're going to go over what you need to do for the fifth homework assignment that's due this week. Um, we're going to be looking at polynomials starting tomorrow, simplifying those. Uh, just a quick programming note. Uh, first two assignments, those are more or less review. Uh, you're expected to have that knowledge coming into this class from MA100 or your earlier math classes, maybe in high school, maybe here at Northern. If you don't know how to do those, that's fine. Talk to me, uh, come see me in my office hour. If my office hour doesn't work, then email me and let's set something else up. Uh, feel free to use your book, use the resources in WebAssign. So that's your book, 
that's the watchets that are available there. Um, if you just have a quick one, one off question, you can use the ask your teacher button. That's fine. Um, and then, so then we'll be good to go on the five web assignments that I do this Saturday. Um, you do have a written assignment this week. It's up on Educat. Uh, it's waiting for you to get that done. That's going to be due Friday at noon. Uh, so print that off, do it. Uh, please do the extra credit question where I ask you, you know, you know, basically tell me how you feel about math and why and what I can do to improve that. Um, I would really appreciate that feedback so that way I know how to best teach you, how to best help you. Um, and yeah, I think that's about it for today. Uh, I'll stick around for a couple more minutes if anybody has questions, but that's all I've got. Uh, I do have class at nine uh, via Zoom, so um, I do need to head out at that point, but I'll stick around if anybody has questions. Thank you guys very much. I have a question. Fire away. Um, so where's all these assignments? I couldn't find it. Is it on WebAssign? Heck yeah. So I couldn't get the class. How do you get the class like? How do you like get the class? Like, is there a class code or something? Heck yeah, there is. Uh, I described the process in the syllabus. Uh, so I sent that out a couple weeks ago, but it's still up on EdgeCat. Yeah. So if you go ahead, check out the syllabus, uh, it walks you through how to get into WebAssign for this class. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Anything else? Um, can you go over the first part of the conjugate thing? Yeah, sure. Uh, I didn't let's... understand how you canceled um, where that like 48 came from. Oh, okay, that. sweet. So, right. So this looks like uh, this is minus 16 square root to nine. That's what this originally was, right? Because we did four times four. And that's the 16. Okay, yeah. And then the three times three. Now, minus 16 times the square root of nine. Um, I mentioned this. I didn't write this, but I did mention this. This is uh, going to end up being minus 16 times the square root of nine is three. Uh, nine can be written as three squared. And when I take square root of it, we just get good old three. Uh, okay. So I did minus 16 times three gave us our minus 48 here. So good question. And that cleared up? Also, how do we go about um, turning in the written assignment if we print it out? Yeah, you're going to scan it. So I talked yesterday about using Cam Scanner. Uh, you're going to use Cam Scanner app, or if you just have a scanner, or you go to the library. Uh, so you're going to print out the assignment. You're going to write out your work, everything on it. Then you use Cam Scanner to get a PDF file of your written assignment and all your work. You're going to submit that PDF file on Educat. All right. So that that everything? Did that clear everything up? Thank you. Perfect. Awesome. Mr. Midler. Yes, sir. Okay. For one of the homework assignments, either in the first or second one, there was the distance formula for a right triangle, finding the distance between the, the three points. Yeah. I believe okay. I did the problem correctly, but when I entered the answer in, I wasn't sure if I should put it in either decimal or exact form. And I got it incorrect by putting it in decimal, decimal form. Okay. Um, um, WebAssign, th this is one of the things I hate about WebAssign. It can be very particular and yet not tell you it's very particular. You will never, ever, ever go wrong putting in the exact form. So, for example, if I, did, uh, if I got an answer of five-thirds, I would definitely not plug in 1.666. I would always type in five-thirds. It will yell at you if you do five. If you do one point six six six, it will never yell at you if you do the fraction. So fractions, whenever possible. Okay, because I had the decimal and then the exact form was two square root of ten. So I always enter. That that is what you should put in then. So and that's okay. the thing with all these answers is, like for example, if you just, gotcha. if you have like this as an answer to a question, right? This negative twenty five minus five square root twenty three all divided by two. Do not chuck that into a calculator and just give it the decimal. You're going to want to type in that as the exact answer. Okay. I got it. That was my only question. Thank you. Yeah. Great question, honestly. I'm out of here. I'll uh, see you in the morning. <laughs> Sounds good. Anybody else? I had a quick question on the written assignment. Fire away. Can you go over um, – C and D for problem one. 
I wasn't sure um, those two. Okay, so I, all right, I'm going to pull up that written assignment here. Give me 111. All right, so written assignment, written assignment one. Okay, so, yeah. Um, hopefully this is going to let me write on the screen. Uh, I don't think it is. Maybe it is. Maybe. Uh is this gonna work? Maybe. So let's make sure this works. Nope. Okay, so the idea with this, I'm just gonna verbally tell you. Uh, like I said, I got class in six minutes. Uh, but the idea is, okay, so you have that x to the negative four, Divide by x to the negative three, right? Yes. That's what we're looking at? Okay, sweet. Mm -hmm. So when you do the subtraction rule, right? That's the subtraction rule question. Because you have the same base, it's x. So you're going to get x to the negative four minus negative three. So really what the question is, is what is negative four minus negative three? So if you subtract a negative, what you end up doing? You add them. Bingo. Yeah. Okay. okay. So you're going to get negative four plus three. What's that give us? Uh, one. Negative ne one. Negative one. Perfect. So that is your answer. You're going to end up with X to the negative one. If you leave it as X to the negative one, I'm giving you full points. I'm grading this. I'm giving you full points. Oh, okay. So if we don't have to like... Yeah, if yeah. you want to write it as 1 over x by the time you're done with it, great. If not, don't care. Sounds good. Now, for part D, you have that a squared plus p cubed, and you have it to the fourth power, divide by that thing to the second power. Do the subtraction rule, and what you end up with? Um, so you have to subtract the two, so would it be like... Uh... Yeah. I don't know, because what do you do? Leave the chunks, right? Okay. So just think of it as chunk to the fourth, divide by chunk to the second. And what you end up with? You end up with chunk to the what power? The uh, top to the second, because it's the second on the bottom. Yep, yep. so it's going to be chunk to the second power. And okay. then you're just going to foil out that chunk. So you're going to end up with a squared plus p cubed times a squared plus p cubed. Then you go ahead oh. and you do that. Over a squared plus. No, no, no. You got rid of that. When oh, you did the yeah. Subtraction. The same base. Yeah. Okay. Oh, okay. That's okay. why I say simplify, yes, then okay. foil. That's okay. why I put that there. Okay. That makes question, so much though. sense. Good question. Okay. I didn't notice they were the same base. Yeah. So no, no, no. I did that on no, purpose. I, I didn't want to make it that hard. Okay. Okay. Awesome. Yep. Thank you so much. Yep. All right. Anybody else?